fourth consecutive year of a structural def- deficit <clears throat> driven primarily by increasing industrial demand, well, by overall demand. And yes, of course, industrial demand is the lion's share of the demand in the silver market at this time. The Morgan Report with David Morgan. Discover how to build and protect your wealth at themorganreport.com. David Morgan with The Morgan Report, Weekly Perspective. Well, a lot of people in our community picked up this Metals Focus. Precious Metals Weekly was published about a week ago, and I commented on it briefly last week. I'm going to dive into it a little deeper this time. I won't read you the whole thing, but a few highlights. Fourth consecutive year of a structural def- deficit <clears throat> driven primarily by increasing industrial demand, well, by overall demand. And yes, of course, industrial demand is the lion's share of the demand in the silver market at this time. And this weekly goes further into talking about some of the factors. And one of them is the problem is accentuated by the prevalence of silver streaming deals at key base metal mines. Producers are offered an end into these agreements because silver does not drive the core economics of their operations, allowing them to trade silver <clears throat> revenues for lower cost of capital. These streaming and royalty agreements now account for about 4% of total supply further disconnecting byproduct silver production from silver market fundamentals. See here in this pie chart over here that currently silver, primary silver miners, which there's no such thing as a pure silver mine. It's a, it's a mine where the bottom line revenues are predominantly silver dominant. In other words, over the majority of the revenues come from silver, but usually it's a lead zinc silver mine, a copper silver mine, a gold silver mine. Again, there's nothing like a, such as a pure silver mine. Although there have been in the past some that were almost that way, there are very few that are on that profile right now. Regardless, uh, gold has actually come up. You go back 10 years, it was about 13%. Lead zinc going back the same time frame, about 35%. Copper has always hung in there right around 25%. But this is, you know, very much uh, what it's been for a very long time, give or take a couple of percent. A real key here is what's accounting for this basically structural deficit, meaning will mining be able to make up for it? And it said, supply is signed from the peak. The reduction is in part due to decreasing ore grades. And this is rather significant. Ore grades have been decreasing over time. I think Travi, Travi Costa put up something on LinkedIn recently showing the ore grade degradation between Mexico and Peru. I'm pretty sure it was him. He really puts up some good stuff and all attributed to him. I could be wrong, but my memory's pretty sharp. And this is key. As I just said, rising production costs of further constrained silver supply. Take a look at this. That's really going up high, and it's actually above what they're showing here at the end of 2023. It's not far off, but actually it's greater than that. It's more like around 28 or so. But I'm not going to argue with metal's focus. Point being is, if you're Mining $30 silver costs you $28. $2 margin isn't that much, especially in the mining business when you have to go out and comp- get new reserves all the time. Remember, the best gold mine, silver mine in the world ends in failure. Once you've had a, let's say, very profitable, very high margin mine, uh, very high grade, uh, once you get the last ounce out of it, it's done. You're done. You have to uh, <clears throat> bring it back depending on the jurisdiction. So there's costs involved with restoring the land, and then uh, you better find something else. So these companies are always out looking to replace reserves. And if the reserves are not there, or let's say what is available has a lower and lower grade, obviously the costs are going to continue higher. And of course, what we all know, the time in a new supply will be critical as development of a mine takes many years. This means it's implausible that new production could balance the current deficits over the short to medium term. For those short, shortfalls to end, we are instead dependent on recycling and demand to retract to the forecast <clears throat> price rally. This would come soonest in the price sensitive areas, mainly jewelry and silverware. That's true, although what's interesting as gold continues to go higher, uh, people may switch to silver jewelry because it's cheaper than gold. And silverware is about 4% of the market, and I don't think it really affects it that much. Could it? Certainly. Is it price sensitive? Yes. But it really is a minor component. 
And this is a week ago, but you know, if you look at it here, it looks like it's sort of topping out. We did get, you know, a little more up here this last week. Silver is always tougher to analyze. I mean, it's really hard to say what it's doing here. Um, basically, what we've got is kind of a top here at around the 32 and a half level, right in this area. It didn't get higher there, slightly lower. Hard to say. I've been telling uh, the public and our membership that I think we were here for due for a pause here, but it's tough because it won't take much to trigger these markets. But there are a lot of fundamentals that could trigger it higher that haven't, i.e., what's going on with Israel and Iran at the moment. And it hasn't brought it higher, but you know, Monday it could open very high. I'm not going to say. I uh, usually am like I've said in the past, a contrarian's contrarian. Almost everybody, that, at least that I pay attention to, is forecasting, you know, the breakout's imminent and that kind of thing. I don't know. I think we could see a pause here for a month, maybe six weeks, maybe more. Might get some kind of sell-off like we got early in the week last week, or and or I should say this week. And uh, it surprised a lot of people. And then, of course, it bounced back later. And regardless of what you think about the gold-silver ratio, it is important from some aspects. It does tell you how many ounces of silver you need to buy an ounce of gold. Right now, we've been um, above 80 for quite some time, as you can see here. Uh, this is just weeks, but <clears throat> if you look at a yearly chart, uh, I'm looking at 80. It's not even on here. But once we get below 80 on the gold-silver ratio and stay there, I think that's really one of the cues that we'll look for to determine that silver's not only going to continue to outperform gold, but probably at the breakout point. It wouldn't surprise me to see that ratio uh, above 33, 32 and a half at least. And again, it needs to maintain it. Once it does that, and 32 and a half, 33 becomes the support rather than resistance, as many of us have stated, there isn't a whole lot of upside resistance beyond that. So we could or should get an acceleration. And getting near the end of this metals focus update, I show you the ETP holdings. It's interesting as you look on uh, four metals. I'm just going to talk about gold and silver here. But uh, really, the ETP holdings back in you know 2020 uh, were higher than they are now for gold. And same thing for silver. Same thing for platinum. Palladium is a different story. But I find it a bit interesting because, you know, we had the illness and, you know, a lot of money went into the precious metals due to the uncertainty of, you know, all kinds of things, short supply shortages, uh, how bad was it going to be, uh, all kinds of business closures, and everything that went into that. Now, I won't review it any further, but the point being is that that brought a higher demand than we're seeing now, where we have a lot of you know, banking issues, what's China really doing, and of course the wars that we continually speak about. Which I find that rather interesting in a way that that was, you know, higher for physical metal going into the ETPs uh, versus now. But that doesn't mean that, you know, going out a couple of years, it won't be higher. In fact, I expect that it will be. Just a couple more. This is from Reuters on the 8th, a few days back. Gold set for biggest drop in over a month as bets on large Fed rate cuts recede. Uh, yes, it's interest rate sensitive, not as much as a lot of people think when we our true interest rates are still not commensurate with the true inflation rate. But again, as I showed you, this is an article that sort of backs up what I'm thinking. Doesn't mean we're right, but put it out there for you. I find this from Bloomberg <clears throat> rather interesting in a way because Headline, Costco's gold bars fly off shelves as bullion prices smash records because the retail demand in the North America uh, has been really rather pitiful in a way. I mean, there really is not that much going on the retail side. Uh, the dealers, the wholesalers are really full of product, but of course it continues in the East. But maybe uh, Costco's become... <laughs> One of the major outlets, you read the article, it basically indicates that, you know, there's been a lot of metal, a lot of gold sold from the Costco stores. And I'll go ahead and finish up with this one. This is from the Jerusalem Post. Silver miners need $2.1 trillion by 2050 to meet demand. Kind of goes back to the beginning of the sweeping perspective. 
there is an above ground supply of silver that will have to be used to meet the deficits for many years going forward based on what we know today. So that will conclude it for this week's Weekly Perspective. This is David Morgan of the morganreport.com.